Righteous Invasion of Truth with Dr. Abel Damina. Welcome to the ever-increasing word feast. Abel Damina is my name. I'm excited about the opportunity to continually bring up the word of his grace into your spirit to equip you and to build you up. The scripture tells us, he that descended is he that ascended. And when he ascended up on high, he gave gifts to men, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastoring teachers, for the perfecting of the saints. The whole essence of this time we spend together in teaching the word is to equip you so you can do the work of ministry. Brother Paul will say, the things that thou hast learned of me among many witnesses, the same, the same, commit thou to faithful men who will in turn commit unto others. We teach you so you can teach others. We equip you so you can equip others. That's the whole essence of ministry. So I want to welcome you today. And those of you joining for the first time, we're excited to have you connecting into this broadcast. You're going to get really blessed. I guarantee you by the Spirit of God. Now, quickly, I want to mention that the Abel Damina Online Mentoring Academy second batch registration is going on right now. We have till the 30th of August to register new students into this mentoring academy. It's an opportunity for me to mentor you, teach you directly, answer all your questions, give you assignments, mark the assignments, and walk through with you the scriptures, unveiling Christ to reveal your identity in him and equip you to understand the message of the scriptures and the revelation of Jesus Christ so you can flood the world with the knowledge of Christ and the fragrance of his grace. It's so important for you to encourage other people plus yourself to sign into the Mentoring Academy second batch from September to September 2019, one full year. The registration closes on the 30th of August 2018. I'm looking forward to having all of you joining in to the Mentoring Academy. The second thing I want to talk about is Accra, Accra, Ghana. I'll be in Ghana for one day apostolic visit and I'll be preaching at the Power City International Accra campus. The campus is located at Nungua behind the police station. Nungua behind the police station. The number to call for details is 054-7185-281. The number is on the screen. Now, I'll be preaching Sunday morning, the 19th of August, 7.30 a.m., and Sunday evening, 5 p.m. Mobilize everybody you know in Ghana, Accra precisely. Let, let's, let's have that whole place bombarded with people who will encounter the unsearchable riches of Christ. It will be a day that you will never forget in the history of your life. I'm looking forward for such a great time in the city of Accra. I'm excited, friends. I'm excited. Help me spread the news. Share this on your page and let everybody get involved with what God is doing in our time. Let me quickly mention that today as the word comes and as you are being equipped and built up by the word of his grace, you fasting your seatbelt. Let's get on the gospel adventure into the service where the spirit of our God is already moving. Happy viewing. The truth about the Antichrist. Actually, I titled it this morning as the Bible truth about the Antichrist. You will never know about the Antichrist until you know about Christ. In the book of Acts chapter 2 verse 29 to 41, this was immediately after Pentecost. Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us unto this day. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God has sworn with an oath to him, that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he will raise up Christ to sit on his throne. He, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. This Jesus had God raised up, whereof were all his witnesses. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he has shed for this, which you now see and hear. For David is not ascended into the heavens, but he said himself, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit down on my right hand, until I make thy foes thy footstool. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God had made that same Jesus, whom you have crucified, but Lord and Christ. 
Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Pay attention to the content of the message. It was predicated on the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. That was the first message that was preached in Acts of the Apostles. Look at the Bible again. Let's look at another message that was preached in Acts. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 5, verse 42. And daily in the temple and in every house, they cease not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. All right, another message that was preached in Acts of the Apostles is in Acts chapter 8, verse 5 to 8. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ. Unto them. What did he preach? Not motivation, not five steps to success, not how to make it, not breakthrough seminar. He preached Christ unto them. Next verse. And the people who went accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits crying with loud voice came out of many that were possessed with them and many taken with palsies and they were lame were healed. And there was great joy in that city. There was what? Great joy. When the message of Christ is preached, what does it produce? Great joy. All right, look at another one. Acts of the Apostles chapter 10 verse 34. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. But in every nation he that feared him and walked righteousness accepted with him. The word which God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. That word I say, you know, which was published throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all things, which he did both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they slew and hanged on a tree. Him God raised up the third day and showed him openly. Not to all the people, but unto witnesses chosen before of God, even to us who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that it is he which was ordained of God to be the judge of the quick and the dead. To him give all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sin. While Peter yet spoke these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. Again, the message was Christ died. He was buried. On the third day, he rose again. The message was Christ. It was not motivation. It was not success. It was not altar versus altar. It was not who stole my wedding gown. The message that brought the church were messages that were predicated on the death, the burial, and the resurrection. And this is apostolic Christianity. Apostolic Christianity through apostolic Christianity is established on the facts of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. Another message that was preached in Acts of the Apostles in the early church was Acts chapter 13 verse 32. And we declare unto you glad tidings, how that the promise which was made unto the fathers, God had fulfilled the same unto their children. In that he had raised up Jesus again, as it is writ also written in the second psalm, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And as concerning that he raised him from the dead, now no more to return to corruption. He said on this wise, I will give you the sure mercies of David. Wherefore he said also in another psalm, Thou shalt not suffer thy holy one to see corruption. For David, after he had served his own generation by the will of God, fell on sleep and was laid unto his fathers and saw corruption but he whom god raised again saw no corruption be it known unto you therefore men and brethren that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins and by him all that believe are justified from all things from which they could not be justified by the law of moses can i hear a powerful amen all through the New Testament, all through the Acts of the Apostles, all through the apostolic foundation of preaching and teaching in the Church of Christ, the message was the death, the burial, the resurrection, and the benefits that came out of that. The forgiveness of sin, justification, redemption. That's what was preached. And any church that is not preaching that is not the Church of Christ. I'm not saying it's not a church. I'm not saying it's not a church, but it's not the church of Christ. Because if it is the church of Christ, 
the content of the church will be his death, burial, and resurrection. Because the church came out of his death, burial, and resurrection. The Bible says the church which he purchased with his blood. He purchased it with his blood. And the purchasing of the church with his blood was when he died, was buried, and rose again. So now, looking at this antichrist of a person, let me ask you another very intelligent question. In all of these readings that we read, you know, concerning the messages that were preached in the church as the church began, and as the early church, the apostolic fathers began to preach and establish the church, did you see them preach about any ruler that was going to come in the future? Did they talk about any personality we should expect? Everything they preached was what Christ has done for us. They didn't talk about an antichrist, one man that was going to rule the world. Nothing, not even a mention of that in their sermons, in their messages. In the first service we saw that Jesus never talked about the antichrist. There's nothing like that in the message of Jesus. Paul never talked about the antichrist. There's nothing like that in the message of Paul. James never. Peter never. None of the apostles spend their time talking about an antichrist we should expect. So that is already foundationally and doctrinally instructive. None of them talked about it. Just one person mentioned the Antichrist. I was going to look at it doctrinally. In the messages of the New Testament from Acts of the Apostles, you will see that all of their sermons, they didn't talk about anybody else other than Christ. He was buried. On the third day, he rose again. The only time anything differed in their communication was in Acts 15.5. But there rose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees which believed saying that it was needful to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. The word sect in the Greek is heresies. Heresies. H-A-I-R-E-S-I-S. It means an opinion. A group of people in the church formed their own opinion and came out with their opinion and was trying to force it on the people that they must be circumcised and keep the law of Moses. And those people are called a sect. That means it's not part of the gospel that was handed over to us to preach. Another one, Acts 5, 17. Then the high priest rose up and all they that were with him, which is the sect of the Sadducees, and were filled with indignation. Another sect of the Sadducees. Acts 24, verse 5 and 14. For we have found this man a pestilent fellow and a mover of sedition among all the Jews throughout the world and a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. But these are confessed unto me that after the way which they call heresy, so I worship the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and the prophets. They call brother Paul a heretic. And Brother Paul was saying, well, they call me a heretic because I was preaching about the fulfillment of the prophecy that was given to my fathers. So, a sect is a group of people who share a certain opinion. Look at Acts 26 verse 5. Which knew me from the beginning, if they will testify that after the most greatest sect of our religion, I lived a Pharisee. Paul used to be in a sect. And that sect was the sect of the Pharisee where they went around everywhere forcing people to obey the law of Moses. So Paul said, I used to be in that sect, a group of people that have an opinion, all right, that is contrary to the message of Christ. Acts 28, 22. But we desire to hear of this, what thou thinkest. For as concerning this sect, we know that everywhere it is spoken against. They were saying that Brother Paul was a sect. They called what Brother Paul was teaching heresies. 1 Corinthians eleven nineteen. For there must be also heresies among you, that they which are approved may be made manifest among you. Brother Paul was talking to the church in Corinth. Galatians 5, 20. Idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies. So a heresy is a work of the flesh. It refers to an opinion or a belief system. And some people have this kind of opinions in a particular denomination. And they have used it to box themselves. They've used the opinion to keep themselves. Like some sects or some religious groups, they have formed their own opinion on water baptism. And they have stayed with it. That's a sect. And some other sect have formed an opinion that the bread and the wine is the blood and the body of Jesus. That's a sect. Oil, pouring of water. Holy water, all those are sects because those are not core teachings of Christ. Handkerchief as mantle. Oil, they call it God in a bottle. All that is 
is heresies. Is heresies. Because it is an opinion that has been formed by a sect that goes against the teaching of Christ. Eating popo in the church. Banana in the church. Oranges in the church. Then as you are eating in the pastor is shouting you shall be fruitful. It's a sect. It's an opinion against the teaching of Christ. Because in the New Testament, the born again believer does not have symbols. We have reality. Amen. I said amen. amen. So like I said, some people will just stay with things that are not called teachings of Christ. Different opinion from what the world teaches. It's called the work of the flesh. You know, somebody carries oil and he says, I will smash this bottle and you will run mad. That is occultism. That is occultism. Or you give somebody Ribena in a bottle. You tell them when you go to office, pour it in your office. Just pour it. That is occultism. That's not the teaching of the gospel. That's not the teaching of Christ. That churches are doing it doesn't mean it is right. That big, big denominations are indulging doesn't mean it is right. It is a work of the flesh. It is not a core doctrinal teaching of Christ. The born again man, the man in Christ, the spiritual man does not function with symbols. It functions with the reality. Second Peter 2 1. But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privately shall bring in damnable heresy. The word damnable is the word destructive, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. So we will see Peter again because he addresses this issue of the Antichrist well. So we shall see Peter again. But please take note, very important. He says a strong word here that they will deny. Denying the only Lord Jesus who bought them. And what Peter is simply saying is these people are not believers. Okay? And because they are not believers, they teach damnable heresies. So now, in the book of Acts of the Apostles, the challenge they had was an opposition of the gospel of grace. An opposition. The sects that kept coming out. They kept teaching things that opposed the finished work of Christ. That was their major problem in Acts of the Apostles. Opposition against the gospel of grace. There was a threat brought by the Jews. And they went against, you know, the fact that Gentiles cannot be believers except they are circumcised that was the major problem they had in the book of acts no one was prophesying or fighting for someone that will appear from somewhere in acts of the apostles the issue of an antichrist did not even show up at all it was not an issue at all in the acts of the apostles the only problem they had in acts of the apostles was a teaching or teachings or practices or they had what are called doctrinal debate. Doctrinal debate. Should we keep the law? Should we not keep the law? There was nothing like Antichrist. There was nothing like a world ruler that will come and stamp people with 666. It was not an issue. It didn't exist in the foundation at all. In Acts chapter 8 verse 21, we see another character showed up in the early church. His name, Simon the Sorcerer. Acts 8, 21. For thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter. For thy heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent therefore of this thy wickedness. And pray God, if perhaps the thought of thy heart may be forgiven thee. Give me verse 20. But Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. This was where somebody wanted to buy the power of God. And then he wanted to use the power of God and combine with sorcery. They wanted to combine the power of God with sorcery. Magus. Magus. That's the Greek word. Magus. It's a compound word for those who do sorcery. Who are into magic. They use magic and sorcery to fetch money. You know. They can call their place a church. But what they are using is magic and sorcery. They flabbergast people. They use magic. And, you know, gullible people are taken in. And they use it to collect money. But my friend, you don't need to go to church to watch magic. There are professionals out there in the circles. If it's magic you want, go and watch them there. The church is never a place for magic. 
But it's unfortunate there are some people who have discovered that the only place they can use and do magic effectively and deceive people is in a place that has a cliche or a brand called a church. And I do not blame them if people deserve the kind of pastor they have. Because they are itching ears. There are people who don't care about truth. When you teach them truth, they are not happy. They want somebody to wow them. They want somebody to just wow them. Whether it deceives them or not, it doesn't matter. As long as their emotions are being entertained. And that's why I keep repeating. If people have the kind of pastor they deserve. There was a sect and uh, this guy was a magician. It was a spellbinder. And then he saw the apostles operating the supernatural and miracles were happening without efforts. He now took a bag of money and came to the apostles and said, I want to buy. I want to buy this anointing. Peter said, you go perish with your money. You cannot buy the power of God. Your heart is not right. So there are people that will do anything to see if they can get power to wow people. And some of them go into witchcraft and they sell their soul. And they get strange things following them. And they come before a crowd and they wow everybody and they take their money. And the people just go like zombies. And in such places, you are not allowed to think. You are not permitted to reason. There's no logic. They just tell you, you cannot question the man of God. After all, touch not my anointed. They use certain cliches to keep you in mental captivity. But that day is over. Freedom is coming to the body of Christ. Light is coming to the body of Christ. If you're in this building, let your amen slap the devil. Amen. You're looking for how to wow people. There are people like that. All right? So Peter began to warn that those people are going to come. And he didn't say it's a person. He says people, teachers, false teachers, false prophets. It's not singular. It's a group of people. So the challenge of the gospel, therefore, in the Acts of the Apostles number one, was... Keeping the law. They had issues with people who insisted that the Gentiles must keep the law. Number two, they had irritants like Simon the sorcerer who said he will buy God's power with money. Number three, they also had governments. Governments that opposed the gospel. People like Herod, people like uh, Pilate who opposed the gospel from Acts 3 to 28. You will see governmental role in trying to slow down the work of God. Either through the chief priests, elders, rulers, high priests who oppose the preachers of the gospel. We saw that in Acts of the Apostles. Number four, we will see those who believe who also were preaching their opinion as a sect. They were in the church, but they had their own opinion. It's like somebody keeps insisting. How can Dr. Damina say no water baptism? I like everything he's teaching, but I know that one. Now you are just trying to be a sect among us. You're just trying to be a sect. Because first of all, you're very unfair. And you're very, 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 very unkind to me. The reason is because you cannot just follow my teaching just one sentence and you take and run. Go and get all the cities where I took time to doctrinally establish that water baptism is not a New Testament teaching. And then sit down and listen to all the teaching and exhaust it. If after that, you still find out that I didn't say anything substantial, then you can arrive at a conclusion. Before you conclude on a man, you've got to listen to that man majorly. If you are listening to 1,000 1, hours of my teaching, then you can conclude, at least for starters. What about baptism is not New Testament. What about baptism is a shadow. It was operated under the shadow by the last prophet, John the Baptist. And somebody said, but they did it in the New Testament how many times? There were things that were carried over from the Old Testament into the New because the church was just growing. They carried some practices. But as the church grew in knowledge, those things disappeared. They are not core New Testament teachings. People that want to learn, they patiently follow. You won't fail. I said you won't fail. So we, we look at those who believe who also were inside the church, but they had their opinion as a sect. Then in Acts 15, 1, we see those whom Paul said were just Pharisees, who said, except you are circumcised, you cannot be saved. There are also those challenges in Acts of the Apostles. But nobody, somebody said nobody, said very loud, nobody preached about expecting someone to rise from somewhere. 
Nobody. In fact, somebody else in Acts 13 that Paul dealt with, Acts 13, 6, Paul dealt with that guy. His name was Bar Jesus. The meaning of the word Bar is son, son of Jesus. Bar Jesus, just like you have Simon Bar Jonah, son of Jonah. All right, Bar Jesus. Acts 13, 6. And when they had gone through the isle unto Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew whose name was by Jesus. Somebody said, but that man of God, his name is Joseph Jesus. How can you say he's not a genuine man? That a man's name has Jesus on it doesn't make him genuine. That a church is called Jesus Christ of power doesn't make the church a church. When you enter and sit down, how you conclude that a church is a church is you stay there for one, two, three, four weeks and listen to the content of the message. If the content of the message does not have the facts of the gospel, it's not a church. What are the facts of the gospel? He died. He was buried. On the third day, he rose. Every teaching of the Bible has to carry those facts directly or indirectly. That's what makes it the gospel. Because if Christ be not risen, your faith is in vain. There's no basis for faith if Christ never rose from the dead. It's the resurrection of Jesus that guarantees our faith. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Romans chapter 15 verse 30. Now I beseech you brethren, for the Lord Jesus Christ's sake, and for the love of the Spirit, that you strive together with me in your prayers to God for me. That I may be delivered from them that do not believe in Judea. And that my service which I have for Jerusalem may be accepted of the saints. Romans 16, 17. Now I beseech you brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses. Contrary to the doctrine which you have learned and avoid them. Avoid anybody that will bring anything to you contrary to what I have taught you doctrinally, avoid them, mark them, and avoid them. So the problem in the book of Acts was doctrine, including the opposition of kings and rulers. What was the problem of Simon the sorcerer? He was hindering the deputy from hearing the gospel. So the attack was on the message. The attack was... On the message to stop the man from hearing the message somebody shout hallelujah romans 15 30 it is still an attack on the message romans 16 17 contrary to the doctrine avoid them he didn't say pray for them he didn't say pray for them what did he say avoid once a man starts speaking contrary things to the doctrine you have learned don't tolerate him don't pray for him. What do you do? Avoid him. Avoid him. Do you go to university and start arguing with your lecturer from class one? As soon as you just enter class, the lecturer says philosophy. He says, excuse me, that's wrong. It shouldn't be called philosophy. It should be called anti-philosophy. Do you behave like that? In fact, sometimes for the one year of being in school, you don't ask any question. You just keep writing notes and seeking to understand. You don't stand up and be arguing when you have not had anything. It is a public display of folly. You listen first. And you listen well. And you listen enough. You don't just casually listen. No. And how many of you have discovered as members of this church that I've taught some things you didn't understand and you had a lot of questions, but as you kept coming and I kept teaching progressively, all your questions got answered. How many of you have observed that? Yeah, because we can't teach everything in one day. I always ask questions. Do you graduate the day you matriculated? That you came in the morning, you matriculated, in the evening you graduated. Is there any school like that on earth? Even on that digital age, you don't matriculate and graduate the same day. And that's why for most of the time you're quiet. I'm the only one talking. Why? Because you're trying to understand. With all you're getting, get understanding. Don't be critical. When you're critical, I can tell you the truth, you'll never grow. Critical people never grow. They're like traffic policemen who stand in one place and they're directing traffic. Critical people are like that. You don't grow. If you're going to grow, you must be meek. Jesus said, be meek and lowly in heart and you shall learn of me. And then you will hear some people will say, principles of habitation, no power, no power, no power. 
You know what they call power? Magic. Magic. Drama. And some of them will say, only Greek and Hebrew, every time Greek and Hebrew, Greek and Hebrew without power. Greek and Hebrew without power. You can even see that they have a problem even with Christ. They have a problem even with Christ. Everything somebody believed on earth, somebody said it. Somebody must have said it somewhere for you to believe it. So in Romans 16, 17, Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned and avoid them. Why? For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. Their own belly, they serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly. If your Bible was my Bible, I will underline belly. Belly. That word belly means they serve their own appetite, or they serve their own desire, or they serve their own ambition, what they want to become. So they take advantage of gullible people, and they take advantage of your illiteracy to fuel their ambition. They serve not our Lord Jesus Christ. And then look at how he classifies them. They are contrary to the doctrine. Romans 6.17 But God be thanked that you were the servants of sin, but you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered to you. You have obeyed from your heart that form of doctrine. So already you have doctrine. Already, doctrine has been communicated to you. Already, doctrine has been taught you. So, when you come across people who are speaking things that are contrary to that doctrine that you receive in Christ, where you are saved, you mark them and avoid them. It's important. Mark them and avoid them. Because those people, they are not serving our Lord Jesus Christ. But they are serving their appetite, their belly. They are serving their greed and their ambition. They are not after Christ. Which means that the gospel is the teaching about Christ. The gospel is the teaching about Christ. It's not a teaching on how to make it. It's not a teaching on how to succeed. It's not a teaching on how to make money. It's not a teaching on, on entrepreneurial skills. The gospel is not a teaching on how agriculture can help in the time of recession. The gospel is not how you can get involved with things that will make you to have a plan B when times are tough. The gospel is the message of Christ. And if the message of Christ is not preached, the gospel is not preached. It is the gospel of Christ. And that gospel of Christ is the power of God. Glory. What is the gospel of Christ? The power of God. The power of God. So these people serve not Christ, but their belly, their appetite. And he says, by good word, by good word and fair speeches. That word, good word there, by good word, is the Greek word, Christology. Christology means lovely message or good preaching. Those people are good preachers. They can preach out of your seat. They can preach out of your chair. You start listening to them, you don't know when you stand up and you're vibrating. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Their preaching is good. They preach good messages. But the content of the message is not Christ. They are preaching a good message, but the content is not Christ. And what they are saying is massaging your emotions, but it's of no spiritual impact. Your body is feeling nice, and your head is excited because they are saying things that sound nice. But when you look at the content, it is Christ barren. The content is Christ barren, but you can feel a psyching. They make you feel good about yourself. The gospel is not the gospel of me, it's the gospel of him. 
And if it is his gospel, then it is not my gospel. And if it is my gospel, then it is not his gospel. Good words. Good words. Oratory. How many of you have sat under an orator before? Orators. Oh, you like the way they talk. They can talk till you are open your mouth. Uh, they have flabbergasted you. Orators, they speak fantastic. They don't have to be born again. They are good speech makers. But the gospel is not public speaking. And the gospel is not oratory. The gospel is the message of Christ. Anybody can preach it. Whether you went to school or not. Once you know the facts, you can preach it. You can preach it in your dialect. You can preach it in any other dialect. The Bible says they will use good words. You can develop oratory to wow people and inspire them, but you're not preaching the gospel. You can be so dry in your teaching, but you're teaching the sound word of God. They didn't hear that. A preacher can be so boring. I don't know if you have met some boring preachers before. And when you meet boring teachers, you, they teach nothing exciting. But if you pay attention, by the time they are through, you have understood what they are saying. And that's what matters. It's not the oratory, it's the understanding. The anointing of God is no emotion. It's not about me showing you how anointed I am. Uh -uh. It's about me unveiling to you who you are in Christ. So that all of us can rise up anointed and do the works of Jesus. It's not about me. It's about him. Because if it's about me, it's not about him. And if it's about him, it's not about me. Glory to God. So be careful. And then there's another word that he used, fair speeches. The Greek word is heulogio. Heulogio. Used for praises. You hear them say, you are a bomb about to explode. You are a bomb about to explode. Somebody say, I'm a bomb about to explode. Somebody say, I'm a bomb about to explode. <laughs> you don't want to say because you know better, right? <laughs> I'm overtaking my overtakers. I'm an undertaker in the spirit. <laughs> Nobody defeats me. <laughs> Fair speeches. They wow you. You know. Glory to God. I say glory to God. And that's why you've got to stay with the gospel. You've got to stay with the message of Christ. Very important. Touch your neighbor say stay with the Bible. Stay with the scriptures. Stay with the scriptures. And now look at why they will use good words and fair speeches. Bible said they will use it to deceive the heart of the simple. The word simple there is naive. To deceive the heart of the naive. Okay? You're flabbergasted. They give you very lovely, nice sounding stories. Sometimes you even cry. <laughs> the stories are so nice. And in the book of Romans, Brother Paul did not waste his time. He took time to highlight this. 1 Corinthians 15, 12. Now if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how says some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? So there was a group of people in the church that came out as a sect and they began to preach that there is no resurrection. No resurrection. And Brother Paul said, uh -uh, in this church in Corinth, why are people coming out with a theory that there is no resurrection? And they believed it and they were preaching it. Heretics. That there is no resurrection. And that teaching does not have any bearing with the gospel. Does not have any bearing whether with the scriptures or with the New Testament. No bearing at all. But they were in the church and they rose with that teaching. So the issue in the Corinthian church was what was being preached. So again, have you discovered that whether in Acts, Romans, is some people or a group of people or a sect or a ministry, no particular mention of a man. No particular mention of one man. It's either a group or a sect or a group of people. That's what we've seen Consistently all through these teachings. Second Corinthians 11.2 For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband. That I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear 
lest by any means, as a serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if you receive another spirit, which you have not received, or another gospel, which you have not accepted, you might well bear with him. Again, in this church, Paul's warning was against a message that was contrary to the message. Not an individual that was going to come and give people 666, but a message that was being preached that was against the message of Christ. Galatians 1 6. I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and will pervert the gospel of Christ. Any message that is not the gospel of Christ is a perversion. It's a twisting of the message. Any message that doesn't have the facts of the gospel is a twist. So it's a new twist to an old message. The message has always been one, Christ. From Moses to the prophets to the Psalms, it's Christ. So anything that is not predicated on Christ, died, buried, resurrected, because whether it was prophecy, types, shadows, it was always a pointer to death, burial, resurrection. The sufferings of Christ and the glory that will follow. Anything outside that is another gospel. It's another gospel. It's a perversion or a twisting of the message. Anywhere it is preached, I don't care. And I don't care the color on the neck of the man preaching it and the title that follows him with all the professional degrees attached to his name. What makes ministry and what makes a minister and what makes a church are the facts of the gospel of Christ as represented in the scriptures and by the revelation of the mystery. Which is Christ died, he was buried on the third day, he rose again for my justification. So what a man or a woman is saying about the gospel, very key. Look at verse 8 and 9 of Galatians. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. Let him be cut off. It was so vital to the preaching of the gospel. Brother Paul said, let him be accursed. It means distance yourself from him. Brother John will say, don't wish him Godspeed. Treat him like something no one should tolerate. Don't go to his meeting and don't bring him to your own meeting. Ephesians 4.14 That we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the sly of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. First of all, they are tossed to and fro. Then after that, they are carried about. You are watching them on TV, listening to them on radio, and they are tossing you to and fro, and eventually they carry you about to their convention. It started with television. It started with radio. You are listening to them, or you are watching them on Facebook. And then you are trying to accept them in love. Let us unite the body of Christ. There are things we cannot pretend about. There are facts we cannot compromise. I believe in God our Father. I believe in Christ our Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection. Those are core issues that are not debatable. Once a man don't believe it, the early fathers, after Peter, James, and John, them, the early fathers of Christianity sat down and wrote the creed. That creed was the statement of faith that is the core doctrine of Christianity. I believe in the virgin birth. I believe in the saints' communion and in the holy church. I believe in the resurrection that we will rise again. Those are core issues. That is where we start from. We don't explain those ones. That is what we stand on. Then we start teaching from there. If you don't believe it, we have no common ground. That's where we start from. We start from 
I believe that God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, received up into heaven. That's what we believe. It's not to be debating, did Jesus rise on the third day or second day? The main thing is, he rose. He rose. We don't negotiate it. Those are called historic apostolic stands. And anybody that doesn't believe that, keep him at a distance. Keep at a guy. Bula togege. Ile mononga. Jigona bahoda. Breyanonga. Hey, yeah, 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 yeah. Stand up, let's close this service. Glory! 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 I believe in life eternal. I believe in the virgin birth. I believe in the saints' communion and in your holy church. I believe in the resurrection when Jesus comes again. Cause I believe in the name of Jesus. Cause I believe in the name of Jesus. Glory! That's what we believe. That's our faith. Mitola na mato legege. Zinge mu na ganga la na moshka. Egelere bo suta la nama. That's our blessed faith. That one of these days, mortality shall put on immortality. We shall be changed in a moment, in the twinkling. Gebo shatala nama. The way he rose, we shall rise with him. Glory! Somebody shout, I have eternal life. Right now, that's what I believe. See, these things are not a feeling. They are not a feeling. These are the things we believe. We believe them because we know. They are not how we feel. How we feel doesn't change it. Jesus rose from the dead. Do you believe? Do you feel it? Whether you feel it or you don't feel it, that's what we believe. Because that's what the gospel has presented to us. These are core issues. Anybody that doesn't have this, don't tell him, save Johnny. Don't bid him Godspeed. He said, if you wish him well, you are a partaker of his evil work. Brother John said that. We don't debate these issues. These are no issues of, okay, how do you know that Jesus rose from the dead? Uh -uh. How do I know? How do I know? It is not up for debate. He rose from the dead. That's what I believe. How do you believe it? Because it happened. Over 500 people saw him when he rose. What are you talking about? I didn't say two people. Over 500. Amen. Amen. We believe. I pray for everybody under the sound of my voice in this service. By the power of that resurrection. And the spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in your mortal body. I decree your mortal body is quickened. In the name of Jesus. Everything that does not look like Jesus in your body, I command it to be flushed out. Receive healing for your body. Receive healing for your body. Receive healing for your mind. Receive healing for your mind. Receive healing for your mind. In the name of Jesus. And I command you to stand fast in the liberty wherewith Christ has set you free. And you will no more be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. In the name of Jesus. You are blessed beyond the cause. You are kept in Christ. In the name of Jesus. You are built up a spiritual house. To offer spiritual sacrifices unto our God. You are a royal priesthood. You are a chosen generation. You are a peculiar people. You are a holy nation. You are called out of darkness. Into his marvelous light. I decree continue to show the praises of God. In the name of Jesus. Thank you Father for answered prayer. In Jesus precious name. And every believer shout I believe. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. I believe you've been affected, impacted by the word of his grace. That's the whole joy that when the word of God comes, life comes and life comes alive in the heart and in the minds and the understanding of God's people. Don't go away, please. This is very important. 
Abel Damina Mentoring Academy is, is registering the second batch, which begins from September to September 2019, 12 months. We're going to be together in the class where I will teach. You will ask questions. I will answer your questions and I will give you assignments and I will specifically mentor you for 12 months, equip you, build you up and educate you in the revelation of Jesus Christ. If you want to register today, the email address to send your mails to for registration is on the screen right now. Once we get your mail, our office will send all the materials that you need to you today to enable you to register before the 30th of August 2018. I'm really excited and looking forward to an explosive time in the Mentoring Academy. Help me share the news with other people and share this announcement on your page. Thank you for doing that for me. The second thing I want to talk about is Accra, Ghana. I'll be in Accra, Ghana this week, Sunday precisely, the 19th of August, 2018. And I'll be preaching two services, 7.30 a.m. and 5 p.m. the same day. It's just one day apostolic visit and impartation. Brother Paul says, I long to see you, that I may impart into you spiritual gifts to the end, that you may be established. There is an establishing that comes to you through knowledge. Through knowledge is so critical. Mobilize everybody, your family, your friends, loved ones, everybody in Accra and the whole of Ghana. Those of you living outside Ghana, you can plan to just travel down for that one day. Two services that you will never forget. It's going to be at the Power City International Accra Campus, Nungua, behind the police station. And the number to call is 054-718-5281. It's so critical. Sunday morning, 7.30 a.m. and 5 p.m. In fact, don't meet me there. Beat me there at the conference venue. I'm excited, friends. Looking forward to bringing more of God toward your way. And until then, enjoy the grace of Christ. Amen.